Welcome back again. It's been quite a lot of moving around this afternoon. Um, so I'm delighted to announce that we are going to move into the second segment of our fabulous lightning talks. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Matthias Amon and Arthur Smith, who will be talking about their work with the Hawking Thesis. Thank you. Great. So as you hopefully will all have heard, um, back in October, as part of Open Access Week, Stephen Hawking's Cambridge PhD thesis was made available open access. Um, I was going to show off a bit the international impact this had, but I'm not sure we can compete with Jasper in that regard. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, just to give you a bit of background, um, as you, this will probably be familiar to most of you. So, students, PhD students, deposited a copy of their thesis in the UL, um, but readers have always been able to request copies. They used to be hard copy, but um, now they obviously they have been digital for a long time. So digital copies of these theses provided by the Digital Content Unit have existed. Um, these scanned theses were uploaded to the repository, so they were more easily findable, but they would still need to be requested and paid for by the readers. Um, so back in 2015, before I worked in the Office of Scholarly Communication, um, they ran a couple of projects to increase the numbers of theses that were actually available freely. So one was to contact some of these alumni whose theses had been digitized to ask them if they were willing to make them open access. And the other was to actually target famous alumni, people who were big in their field, um, and ask them the same question and offer to digitize them if they hadn't already been so. And this is how, for example, the theses of Jermaine Greer and Jocelyn Bell Burnell are now available open access um, through the repository. Um, so Stephen Hawking was obviously also contacted as part of this. But for whatever reason, we never got a response. Professor Hawking's thesis was always the most requested item in the repository, um, which, apart from anything else, meant a lot of work for the repository team to deal with these requests. Do you remember how many there were? There were... I think, I mean, we processed several hundred requests. I think yeah, it seemed so was about 100 or so. Exactly. Um, and so when I joined the OSC in the summer of 2016, there were all these rumors about why he, hadn't, he had said no and why he didn't want this to happen and it had become sort of the white whale of the OSC um, to a certain extent. There are all these myths around it. And this is where a certain element of serendipity comes into play in that early last year, we were interviewing for a temporary job uh, in the OSC, and one of the people who applied was a former personal assistant of Professor Hawking's. And so after the interview, we asked her, so do you know if he's ever actually received these messages, and what was his opinion, and otherwise how can we contact him? And she was like, well, he gets so many emails, you know, not quite sure. One way of doing it might be to contact Professor Nigel Peake, who's the head of the maths department, because he's technically his boss. So <laughs> eventually, I got around to sending an email explaining the situation to, to Professor Peake. And two days later, I received an email from um, Stephen Hawking's technical assistant, which said, dear Matthias, Professor Hawking grants you permission to make his thesis available open access. And at that point, I will hand over to Arthur. <laughs> yeah. So then something happened. So, <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, we, um, well, we did a lot of work in the background, really, before the, the announcement happened. Um, so Professor Hawking's thesis had been digitized some time beforehand, but that was a rather horrible digitization. It was just a black and white copy. So we worked with the digital content units to re- scan his thesis in a much higher quality and in colour, which was great. And um, then we put it on the, on the repository. And um, we were waiting for Open Access Week, which was the 23rd of October. And so we, we waited for them and we kept his thesis locked down. Uh, but about a w two weeks before that or so, we got an email from Professor Hawking saying, um, why isn't his thesis available? <laughs> <laughs> so... Well, we just had to make it open access. So we actually made it available actually well in advance of open access week. And we could see immediately that there were downloads occurring. And then on the, I think it was midnight on the 23rd of October, uh, the university released a press release about this that we prepared with them. And almost immediately after that, the repository saw a massive increase in traffic. And I think within the first couple of hours, we'd seen about 10,000 downloads. And over the course of about three or four days, I think we got up to about a million. It's hard to judge because the repository crashed, uh, just under the enormous weight of all this. And we could see, actually, it was really interesting to watch this happening in real time because 
Um, at various points in the day, different news organisations picked it up. And then at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon that day, uh, Professor Hawking announced it on his uh, Facebook page, which I think has about 3 to 4 million followers. So almost instantaneously, 3 to 4 million people saw that message. Uh, and then again, the repository crashed. So for several days after that, and for several weeks after that, we actually hosted Professor Hawking's thesis on a separate server from the library, uh, so that it didn't actually interfere with the repository at all. Um, but this was, I mean, this has been a great thing. Um, we've seen uh, a huge increase after, after this news of the uh, Hawking's thesis being released. We got uh, enormous number of requests from alumni who wanted to make their thesis available. And we've actually had funds available from, um, yep. <laughs> Uh, we've also had funds available from Arcadia to help digitise some PhD theses. And it also catalyzed people in other universities to make their thesis available. So I think it was UCL or Imperial said that they'd had people request their theses to be made open access because of the news of that Stephen Hawking's thesis. So um, yeah, if you want to crash a repository, <laughs> this is how you do it. So we're going to try and find another uh, thesis and hopefully this won't happen again. Thank you very much, really interesting. Um, next up, I'd like to welcome Libby Tilly, who will be talking to us about information literacy frameworks. Thank you very much. Um, right, just to test that you're awake, and because you might need to do this in the next three minutes, just put your hands up. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent, great. So there may be some interactivity in this little talk of mine. So I've been um, involved over the last nine months or so in um, a task and finish group, which was looking at the training that we do in our libraries across the board. And um, as part of that sort of initial project, we came up with just two really easy, really simple things that we thought needed to happen in Cambridge. And one of them was an information literacy framework for Cambridge libraries. Now, before I go into a little bit about what that is, Hands up, anyone who saw in November and December, anyone saw MasterChef The Professionals? Okay, not that many of you. Okay, hands up then, anyone who knows what a deconstructed recipe is? Oh, way more. Excellent, fantastic. Okay, well, in MasterChef The Professionals, there were a lot of deconstructed recipes. And one of my favourites was the flapjack one, okay, where I believe the winner, Craig... Um, deconstructed flapjack for one of the recipes that he produced for um, the, the people to, uh, to judge. And I started thinking about food, and I started thinking about information literacy, and I thought to myself, you know what? Currently in Cambridge, guess what? We are a deconstructed hamburger. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. <laughs> um, and what we are, we're full of the most fantastic ingredients you could possibly ask for in a university library system. We do the most amazing stuff with our students, whether it's on one-to-ones, whether it's inductions, whether it's full-blown lectures, you name it. We are brilliant. We are that deconstructed recipe, if you like. Deconstructed hamburger. And I thought, right, information that's your framework. What is the framework about? The framework is actually about trying to bring all of this together, the same brilliant stuff, but instead of spread all over a plate, like my deconstructed flapjack idea, it's all together. It's actually held together. Same stuff, same quality, same brilliance, excellent stuff, all happening, but it's all contained in one thing. And we have this amazing opportunity, I think, with the framework in terms of going forward of being able to sell what we do, if you like, to the higher authorities, to our students, to our academics, to our partners in DRC, careers, language centre, you name it. We have an opportunity to sell a story about what we do very quickly and easily and simply by using the information literacy framework. Okay, that was easy, right? However, there's quite a lot to do once you've created a framework, because we could create a framework and then we could say, oh, that was jolly nice, thank you very much. But in terms of where we go forward, we need to actually think a little bit harder. So the second thing that came out of the Task and Finish group was the fact we need a much bigger project going forward. It needs to be something which is consistently identifiable, 
but still retaining diversity, still retaining varied content held within that framework. And this is really where I want you all to raise your hands. Can you all do that? Excellent, thank you. Do you want to help? Yes, fantastic. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> right, we do need help going forward with this. We have masses of people already who are already helping us in various teams and projects, and we've got lots and lots of work to do to get this information literacy framework embedded and useful. We're hoping to get some money to help us through a bid and so on and so forth. And we really want you to come and help us. Anyone who's got any interest, even if you don't have an interest in it, do you like spreadsheets, for example? Hands up if you like spreadsheets. Oh, we've got a few. Yes, see, you want to help. You definitely want to help. OK, so we would love you to come and help um, with this information literacy um, project. There's my name, um, EAT21. Just email me if you think you'd like to help, and I will be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Libby. Um, next up, we have Patricia Killard from the University Library, who will be talking about journals. for starting with the, the least thrilling um, presentation title and project title um, you'll, you'll come across this week. Um, it's been put together um, quite quickly, so we haven't yet had time to come up with a, a sexy title for it. Um, journals are central to much of what we do in supporting um, research in particular. Um, and they're an incredibly expensive item for the university. We spent, um, we'll spend this year about 5.4 million pounds through the journals coordination scheme um, and that figure as you probably know is likely to, to rise over um, the next few years but we actually know remarkably little um, about the big picture of journals we, um, and we know about citations and we know um, about downloads um, but really we don't understand the full landscape so this um, project uh, is which is in three parts, as, as you see, with a report at the end and some publicity um, around it, um, attempts to, to address that issue. So journal subscriptions, as they are um, usually understood in terms of downloads, um, and our figures are absolutely fantastic for that. We make enormous use of our journals, something like nine million downloads a year in the university. But Cambridge researchers are major contributors to journals um, in, in a number of different ways. Um, clearly, they're writing articles, um, but they're also um, uh, peer reviewing, they're editing. And this bigger world of journals, um, we really know remarkably little about. Ah. Um, the project comes out of um, the journals working group that was established last year um, in response to what I would call researchers' um, demand for a much bigger conversation about journals in our lives and how much we're investing, in particular, in big deals. Um, the working group doesn't um, take decisions on the big deals. Um, that is for the um, JCS steering group in conjunction with the university librarian. Um, but it does, um, it's a chance to have a bigger conversation about them. But when we started to think about, for instance, um, a plan B, what we would do if we didn't feel we could sign up to a journal agreement, a national journal agreement, or if um, there was no way nationally of um, reaching agreement with publishers. We could walk away, as the Germans, and someone mentioned earlier, um, the German academic community has done. But we actually don't know much about the potential impact on that. And that is one of the things that um, we want to address in the project. So the first part is um, the quantitative analysis. Um, where are Cambridge researchers publishing? How much do they contribute through the peer review and the editorial process? And how much of the, the usage is there of these works um, that, that are downloaded and, uh, and cited? So we'll be pulling together lots of data, not just that we already, uh, we already uh, have and it's familiar to us, um, but looking into symplectic for editorial activity, looking at open access costs, um, looking at the spread um, across um, disciplines. Also looking at the, uh, the demographics of our, our researchers. Who are they? 
which departments are they in. Then we will be doing um, some analysis um, and publication, selective publication of our results. Um, some of the, um, the data is actually incredibly useful for us in negotiation, but we don't necessarily want publishers um, to have access to that. But we'll be creating visual maps, so there will be um, ways of uh, making it um, transparent to our um, community. Um, the qualitative data, which I think is of particular interest to me, is looking at um, the long tail of subscriptions, um, how do users engage with these titles, what happens if you're in a small department, you come to the, you're not part of the, the core group that we might subscribe to if we, we cancelled a big deal, you're part of that, that, that you know, it, they're very important to you, but they are part of the long tail. What would be the impact on these users? And that's going to be explored through um, case studies, um, uh, interviews with researchers, so there'll be a qualitative and a, and a conversational um, part of that, and it's very important to capture them. And finally, there will be a report at the end of it to um, the JCS working group. There'll be information for internal and external audiences. Um, I had an email, apparently, from Danny Kingsley about this, because D Danny has been um, heavily involved in, in shaping this project, and I hope she didn't say, and don't promise them, <laughs> it'll be out by the end of Easter term. We will be looking to finish um, the, the, the project by then, but it depends very much on recruitment, um, and uh, we'll be recruiting through um, secondments um, very shortly, and looking at who can actually do that work for us. So those are our contact details, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Patricia. And last but by no means least, we have um, Anne McLaughlin and Alex Devine from uh, Corpus Christi who will be talking about Parker 2.0. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Alex and this is Anne Devine and McLaughlin. And we are very excited and uh, proud and relieved to be here. Uh, to be here that, to announcing the relaunch, the launch of the 2.0 version of the Parker Library on the web, electronic resource um, of the Parker Library's uh, manuscripts, pre-modern manuscripts, medieval and early modern, um, at the library. It has been 10 years in the coming, from the beginning until last night and today, most recently over quite a long time. And many of you in this room have participated gloriously and, and, and would like to recognize your contribution. And over the past months, it has been coordinated predominantly by, by my colleague, Anne. Um, and so I shall, who is going to tell you all about it. All right. Well, it's about 16 hours old at this bit, and you guys are the very first who are hearing about it, other than those who follow us on Twitter. Um, we do have Twitter. It's at Parker Lib with four C's afterwards. And I thought it would be a bit disingenuous to do it via slideshow, so I decided to hedge my bets, and we're actually going to do it live. So, starting from Google, as we all start with, it's the same web address as before, <coughs> parker.stanford.edu. And because that's the way this works, magic. <laughs> Clearly, I am technologically gifted. So, the first major change that we have here is that there's no more paywall. So anyone, anywhere in the world can access this freely. They'll have full access to search, to Zoom, and hopefully in the future to do a bit more. So, let's start with the search for something. How about miscellaneous? Because one of the great things about having a digital library is that you don't need to know what you're searching for. So you can search for anything. And we can see that clearly, this pops up quite a few results. If it decides to agree, and it does, 1,443 of them, to be precise. And that's going to be a number of different types of resources. Page details are annotations that we've made. Uh, they can refer to texts, they can be rubrics, they can be in kibbits to manuscripts. Manuscripts are manuscripts, just like it suggests. And references are reference materials. One of the things we've built into the new site is a fully integrated Zotero bibliography. So if you click on one of our references, it will take you to the citation in Zotero. You can then import that into your own bibliographic software, 
or use it within the Zotero framework if you would like to do that. <coughs> However, I want to narrow this down a little bit. So let's look for things in Old English. And how about the first one? Once you come to a manuscript page, this is what you're going to see. So it's an image of our manuscript. Then we have a brief sort of introduction, more or less, its title, its language, and the years in which it was made. If you want more details, click on the More Details button. And it'll pop up with this. This is all of our catalog data about it, as well as an option to download the MR James record. Uh, M.R. James is, as I'm sure you know, the one who cataloged most of our manuscripts throughout Cambridge. And this is actually just a PDF of his file. If we close that, we can get to the manuscript itself. One of the things that we've introduced is a sort of table of contents for the manuscripts. So you can see what's inside of them. And if you click on one, you'll go straight to the proper page. There we go. All right. So here we have Alfred. He's a Benedictine. And you'll notice there's a blue box around the page, which means if I put my mouse on it, you'll see a transcription of the incipit there. That's how we can search by incipit. If you find that annoying, as many people do, just click on the double boxes, and it'll disappear. You can zoom in. And we're quite lucky that we started off with very, very good images, thanks to the first project team. Those are all here. And you can take screenshots of them. You can make it full screen. You can get rid of this. And if you wanted that information to consult, it's there as well. So there's your summary, as well as some more detailed metadata. Now, we've heard a bit today about IIIF. And I thought that might be one of the coolest things to show you about this. So IIIF is the International Image Interoperability Framework. And it means that you can pull things from two different resources together, and they'll work well. You can search by manuscript as well. So this is pulling up the first bit of the Bury Bible. It's one of our great treasures. It's a massive Bible made in about 1125 in Bury St. Edmunds. We'll scroll down a little bit. And once we're here, this is the beginning of Genesis. What's remarkably modern for something that's almost 800 years old. Over 800 years old. Now, this is a Mirador viewer that we put in here. And it means that I can add slots to it, places to compare other manuscripts. And lots of places are starting to use manuscript repositories, including among them the National Library in Paris, which published lists of their manuscripts. Each IIIF manuscript comes with what's called a manifest. It's where the file is stored. And this is for manuscript Latin I. It's called the Vivian Bible. It's one of the massive Tours Bibles. Because I thought if we're comparing one giant Bible, it only makes sense to compare it to another one. So I'm just going to copy that link. Go back to our original page. Hit Add Item in the center. Paste it where it says Add New Object. And hit Load. and pray that it works. <laughs> Come on. Well, it's not liking it's that at the moment. It's a magnificent Bible. It looks remarkably <laughs> like this. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it here. All right, so here's the Vivian Bible. But my whole point was to try to compare it, right? To show you one of our manuscripts next to another one. So let's do the same thing here. Let's add a slot. I want to get rid of that menu. And then from ours, if we get rid of this, you'll notice there's a little logo that says IIIF at the bottom. 
pick it up, drag it into the Mirador viewer, drag it down, drop to load. Now there's ours. And for us, there's the entire thing. And there's the sound. <laughs> we'll be happy to take your questions. I have my laptop with me, so if there's something you want to see afterwards, I'll have it here, and I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody about it. So, that's us. <laughs>
this conference a reality by speaking, by sharing their knowledge, their expertise, their ideas with us. Um, so thank you very much. If we can have a round of applause for all of our speakers from today. don't need to applaud them because they are not in the room and they've left now, but we should also thank and really want to thank our sponsors um, who have provided the funds to be able to make today possible. Simply without them, today wouldn't happen. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who has sponsored us. Um, the biggest thanks we want to make for the day, actually, um, is our committee. Uh, this is a really big event to organise. There is a huge amount of work that goes on in the background, and it simply couldn't have happened without the support of our brilliant committee, who are yeah. all listed up here behind us. So yeah. I would like um, you to join me in saying a huge thanks to them and all the work they've put in to make today possible. So thank you. On the back of that, the yeah. conference never sleeps. Um, <laughs> so probably not tomorrow, but fairly soon, uh, the recruitment will start for next year's planning and conference. Oh, it yes. has been a fantastically rewarding thing to be involved with, to help organize and plan. I would recommend anyone coming on board. You get to learn a fantastic range of skills. You get to meet some brilliant people, get involved in some brilliant things. So if you've got an interest, uh, please, when the call comes out, do get in touch. If you are a line manager of someone who has an interest, this is a fantastic way for developing your staff skills in a whole new area. So do give them encouragement, give them a bit of time to get involved. It is a hugely worthwhile event. Um, yeah, so, Apart from that, yeah. I think we're pretty much almost done. Yeah, so thank you, all of you, for being here, for contributing, for tweeting, for asking questions, just for saying really nice things. I mean, just having, having you coming up to us and saying, thank you, I'm having a really nice day, actually means the world. So, And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So thank you very, very much for being here, for supporting us, for generally being awesome. And yeah, and one last reminder, badge holders, reception desk, that would be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, so without further ado, to the pub. To the pub. To the pub. Thank you. Thank you.